Good afternoon. The um, committee, the uh, Health and Human Services Finance Division is going to come to order. Um, we apologize that we're starting just a couple of minutes late. We've had a weather delay for our main presenter, and he isn't here yet. So we're going to, while we're waiting for him, we're going to switch up the order a little bit. And um, Dr. Weiberg from the Board of Pharmacy has very graciously agreed to, to go first so that we can get started and use our time well here. Um, I know it's getting to be a busy time here. A lot of our members are not here yet either. We don't have a quorum, but hopefully we will do that soon and, um, and then we'll move the minutes when we, when we do. And so, uh, Dr. Weiberg, thank you very much for filling in and switching your schedule mm -hmm. around here. And if you would go ahead and introduce yourself, and we're really interested in your presentation. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Dr. Cody Weiberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy. And I think what the Chair wants me to do is just explain a little bit about what the Board does and what it doesn't do, because I think there were some questions about our authority. Um, I certainly know a lot about um, the pharmaceutical uh, industry and how drugs are distributed and priced. I know a lot about PBMs. I used to be the state's former Medicaid pharmacy program manager. But Dr. Schondelmeyer, who's going to come here, he is even more expert than I am. So we'll just focus a little bit on the, the Board of Pharmacy here. So the Board of Pharmacy is a state agency. It's an independent, non-cabinet level state agency. Uh, we have been in continuous existence since August of 1885, so we're actually one of the oldest state agencies. Um, and there's a chapter in statutes, chapter 214, that actually deals with all uh, uh, health and professional licensure, or most of it. And uh, in chapter 214, the very first section of definitions, uh, the Board of Pharmacy is named as one of 15 health-related licensing boards. Now, there's also uh, a program at the Department of Health that's included in that definition. That's the Minnesota Department of Health Office of Unlicensed Complementary and Alternative Health Care, and we do work with that office on some uh, issues. But the remaining 15 boards, uh, which would include, I'm not going to name them all, but medical practice and nursing and or psychology and others, um, plus the board of barber examiners, uh, barber examiners and cosmetologist examiners, <coughs> even though they're not health licensing boards, we have long since, long before I became executive director of, the, of my board uh, over 13 years ago, have worked cooperatively cooperatively together. We're all located in the same building, except for cosmetology, who had to move to larger space. We share cost through what's called an administrative services unit, so we don't each have to hire human resource staff and contracting specialists and purchasing specialists. So, uh, and then the Board of Pharmacy in particular works extremely closely with the boards of medical practice, nursing, dentistry, and veterinary medic medicine because uh, those boards all license uh, uh, individuals who prescribe. And all of the statutes and rules about the prescribing and administration and dispensing of drugs, well, not all of them, but the, the basic ones that state who can prescribe, who can dispense, who can possess drugs, are all in the Pharmacy Practice Act, Chapter 151. So we have to integrate closely with what those boards do. Our board in particular has nine members uh, appointed by the governor. Uh, there are six pharmacist members, three public members. A um, little bit different for board members than it might be, for example, a, a commissioner. Uh, board members are appointed to fixed four-year terms, uh, and they can only actually be removed by the governor for some very specific reasons, three or four specific reasons. Um, and the. The board basically serves, you might think, like a board of uh, directors for a corporation in a way. They're not state employees. They're basically volunteers. They do get some, some small per diem and uh, uh, expense reimbursement, but they're basically volunteers. Uh, they meet, in our case, they meet about every six weeks in a general business session. Uh, they uh, basically give me direction on the strategy, the, the strategic direction they want the board to go into. I always go to them 
before I come to you to introduce legislation or to ask for fee increases, that sort of thing, I get their approval to move forward. The board has rulemaking authority, so I always go to them to get authority to engage in rulemaking. So there are some things that only they can do. They, can only, they are the only ones that can issue disciplinary orders and orders to approve variances to rules. But other than that, uh, what they end up doing is delegating most of the authority that's vested in them, they delegate to me through an official delegation of authority that's on file with the Secretary of State. Uh, as executive director, I am appointed by the board, uh, but the governor, uh, even though the governor doesn't directly appoint me, the governor can ask any health licensing board to review the performance of, the, of an executive director and to take any appropriate action up to and including dismissal. Um, and when the governor does that, the governor gets to temporarily appoint a new person to the board to represent his or her interests. Um, now, I am in the unclassified service. I am not a permanent uh, classified state employee, as it were. Uh, I have to be reappointed by my board every year. I'm actually elected every year by the board to be the board secretary. Uh, so, uh, you know, everything that I do is based on my annual performance reviews. Um, and to carry out the tasks of the board office, so that's basically my job, is to make sure that the office of the Board of Pharmacy functions on a day-to-day -day basis and carries out all the duties that we're required to carry out. I, when we're fully staffed, we're down one staff now, but when we're fully staffed, we have 20 uh, uh, other people besides myself, uh, an office manager and six clerical administrative staff that work on licensing issues and do other paperwork. We do have an internal attorney. Uh, he is not our legal counsel. He, an assistant uh, attorney general is our legal counsel, but uh, he basically works on a lot of the disciplinary cases that we have to do, drafting orders and things like that. Uh, Starting in 2010, we uh, began administering the state's prescription monitoring program, and we currently have three PMP staff for that, one vacancy in PMP. And then we employ seven licensed pharmacists. I am also a licensed pharmacist, but we employ seven other licensed pharmacists that are, like myself, certified inspectors and investigators that go out and or inspect the facilities we license in state and conduct complaint investigations. The mission of the Board of Pharmacy, uh, we are, again, we're a public agency, we're a state agency. Uh, I wanna make it really clear that it is not our job to promote the profession uh, or to promote the interest of pharmacists. We serve the public. Our mission is to promote, preserve, and protect the public health, safety, and welfare by fostering the safe distribution of pharmaceuticals and the provision of uh, quality pharmaceutical care to the citizens of Minnesota. There certainly are times when we can work with the professional associations cooperatively because we believe what they want to do does further the interests of the public, but uh, push comes to shove, we uh, serve the public. And Dr. Weiberg, yep. if I could pause you right yep. there. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, we do have a quorum. I would like to yep. entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Um, and uh, Representative Cantrell moves to approve the minutes of January 31st. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The minutes are approved, thank you. And then uh, we have a question from Representative kunish Padin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for being here. Would you please give us an example of what unlicensed complementary, um, what that means? On the, on the first page. As best page. I can. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative, as best I can. We don't work really closely with them, but for example, uh, my understanding is that they would uh, regulate people who might practice traditional herbalism, oh. uh, things like that. They don't, I don't think they do acupuncture. I think uh, medical board might do that. But it, it's, it's alternative care uh, that is not been deemed yet, at least, to be... Um, um, it, it, it's not been deemed by the, the legislature and the governor that they need their own licensing board. So I, th I think, but that's, I think, one example. Maybe homeopathy, okay. homeopathic medicine, things that are not part of the traditional Western allopathic uh, tradition of medicine, like the Board of Medical Practice and, and Nursing and Pharmacy would regulate. Follow up, Representative. Um, thank you. So do, are they 
they're unlicensed, but somehow they have to let you know that they are practicing this or, or how does your, how does the um, Minnesota Board of Pharmacy uh, interact with these groups and, and or what is the responsibility? Commissioner Padin, if I could. So they're under the Department of Health. Okay. So it's a little bit different and I think Dr. Weiberg just put it on here just to flag that it, oh. that it exists and that it has a little bit different relationship, but I think that we could uh, absolutely get some of those questions answered by the Department of Health. That's okay. probably who we should direct that to. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for your presentation. The, uh, you know, I, I represent a rural uh, district, and the independent pharmacists seem to be uh, very stressed financially. In fact, we've had uh, some of the pharmacies go out of out of business or uh, sell out to chains. Uh, and in some of these smaller towns, you have the independent pharmacists go out of business and they have a long drive to have access to prescription drugs. So uh, it's, you know, I just met with some pharmacy representatives. They said in some cases, they actually lose money on, fill, on filling a prescription. So their margins are really tight, which I understand. But um, it seems like the PBMs are prospering and your local pharmacists are, uh, are not. And, you know, we talked about uh, uh, vouchers and uh, paybacks and things like that. We've got some bills to try to get at the, uh, introduce, try to get at the core of that. Does the pharmacy board, are they looking to take a position on some of these bills that might give more transparency as far as the PBMs? or allowing pharmacists to fill more than just an initial prescription. Um, so do you take a position on those bills one way or the other, or what are your thoughts? And Representative Grunhagen, if I could just kind of intervene a little bit here. So the questions you're asking, once again, you're kind of, you're um, giving us the preview of what this entire hearing is meant to answer and to talk about. So I appreciate that very much. And, I think you're, you are asking Dr. Weiberg a, a really limited question, but it, it seems like we're kind of not there yet. If you could hold on to your question, he's gonna, I think our main speaker is here, if, and, and um, Dr. We if we could let Dr. Weiberg kind of really quickly wrap up and go through kind of the meat of what he wanted to tell us about here, actually. So Madam Chair, you want me to repeat everything I just said only later? Kind of, yes, <laughs> okay, Representative Grunhagen, and you might even have a, you might even want to reframe it as you listen to the, what okay. we're going to hear about today, and I'm sure that we'll all have more questions, but you're absolutely right on in asking about that, and that's kind of why we're, why we're here today doing this hearing. Dr. Weiber. Okay, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll finish up real quickly. I only have a couple more slides. And this, this is about the powers and duties because there were some questions about that. So we certainly, as the, our name might imply, we license pharmacists and pharmacies. We regulate the practice of pharmacy and we regulate the operation of a pharmacies. Uh, but we do more than that. We also license the manufacture and distribution of drugs. And so that means we, we, uh, we license drug manufacturers and drug wholesalers. Uh, we also, uh, le uh, b believe it or not, we license or register medical gas distributors, wholesalers, and uh, retailers. So if you've ever had nitrous oxide in the dentist chair or oxygen, we regulate the people that provide that to you. We do inspect the in-state facilities that we license, all of the manufacturers, wholesalers, and pharmacies in-state. And we investigate complaints. We get approximately 200 to 250 complaints per year to the extent that we feel that the allegations are substantiated and they're very serious and significant. The board has the authority to issue disciplinary orders, which could range anything from a reprimand to a fine, a civil penalty, all the way up to revocation of a license. We are authorized to engage in rulemaking. Uh, and I really mention that because included among our uh, authority in that area is the ability to make uh, changes to the state's schedules of controlled substances. So even though we're not a law enforcement agency, we have the same power at the state level that the DEA has at the federal level to change the schedules of controlled substances. 
Although what we do is every December we come back and report those changes to the legislature so they can be also put into statute. As I mentioned, we administer the prescription monitoring program. We provide a lot of technical assistance, uh, like I'm doing right now, to the governor's office and legislators. We work with many, many, many local, state, and uh, federal agencies on drug-related issues. What we don't do, uh, we don't regulate drug prices. We have no authority to do that. In fact, we can go into any uh, facility or business in the state in which drugs are sold. We can look at, we can ask for copies of any of their records, except we're specifically excluded from asking for financial and sales records. So we cannot look at that. We do not regulate the insurance functions of pharmacy benefit managers. Many pharmacy benefit managers, expect, especially the large ones, do operate mail order pharmacies, mostly out of state and they ship into the state. We do license them and regulate them just as we would any pharmacy. We do not regulate the state's medical cannabis program, that's the Department of Health, or the THC Therapeutic Research Act, also Department of Health. We don't regulate the cultivation of hemp and the sale of most hemp products, that would be the Department of Agriculture, but uh, what you may be seeing and hearing about are a bunch of products out there that contain CBD that are being sold as if they were drugs, and we do regulate those. Uh, and uh, we don't enforce the criminal section of the state's Controlled Substances Act. And that's really all I had, and I can take any questions. And, 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 uh, Dr. Weiberg, just to return for a moment to Representative Grunhagen's question, I think the core of the question at the end there was whether you take positions as a board on pending legislation. Was that right, Representative Grunhagen? And could you tell us that? Do you take positions on legislation? Madam Chair, Representative Grunhagen, yes, the board does take positions. It is the board itself that has to take uh, positions. I can tell you on these particular bills, uh, the board has not considered them in a public meeting, and so they haven't, they don't have a, an official position yet on, on these bills. Uh, at their next meeting, they, I will present them these specific bills, and they may or may not take a public position. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weiberg. Um, Representative Baker has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Fairly quick question. I got a couple of them here, but they should be very short. Uh, thank you, and to the to uh, uh, Director Weiberg, uh, you are responsible for licensing the pharmacists and the pharmacies. Is that correct? Dr. Madam Weiberg. Chair, Representative Baker, yes, that is correct. And a follow-up again, Baker. what is the fee for those to pay on an annual basis? Are they different? Are they the same each year? Uh, Dr. Weiberg. Madam Chair, Representative Baker, the current licensing fee for a pharmacist, I know for sure because I just paid it, is $145. And for pharmacies, I believe it is currently $225. Represent Baker. Madam Chair, again, also I see you license the drug manufacturers and the drug wholesalers. How much do they pay into that licensing each year as well? Repres uh, Dr. Weiber. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Baker, it, that varies. Um, so, for example, we license pharmacies that want to also separately be wholesalers. They pay... Uh, I think only about $150. The full-blown manufacturers uh, are going to pay um, in the little over $200, probably $240, something around around that, or maybe $265 now. Yeah, Madam Rep. Madam Rep. Chair, and that's the full-blown version. Okay, that's a and, I'm and sorry, that's Matt, the full yeah. service. I yeah. Bet. Okay. And final question: When was the last time that was changed? Madam Chair, Representative Baker, the last time we uh, had a fee increase, a general fee, fee increase was four years ago. We um, will be, uh, we, we, we've asked the governor to include a fee increase again in this um, session uh, just for our normal administrative costs, not for some additional um, expenditure like you might be considering. Thank you. Uh -huh. And Dr. Weiberg, finally, just to be clear, who sets those fees? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, the legislature does. Yeah, the legislature has to approve the fees. There, what, my understanding is there was a time when the health licensing boards established fees by rules, but that changed sometime before I got here. So we, we need to go to the legislature to get approval of our fees, and of course we have to justify them by doing all the fiscal analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yep. Representative Bierman has a question, and then we're going to go to our to um, Dr. Schondelmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Weiberg. A uh, question on the investigative work that you do. You mentioned two to 250 complaints. Can you tell us the nature of 
what some of those complaints are that you're following up on? Dr. Weiberg. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bierman, uh, there's a wide variety actually. I'd say that the most common complaint is still a dispensing error. Somebody gets the wrong drug, the wrong strength of the drug, the wrong directions. Sometimes you actually have sort of a combination of a dispensing error and a privacy violation, HIPAA violation, because someone with a very similar name is given somebody else's medication. We also have Probably the most common reason we still discipline, though, is the uh, theft of narcotics by pharmacists and technicians from their employer. Uh, we get quite a bit of that, and we, uh, just all sorts of other different sort of complaints, yeah. Okay, j just one more follow-up, please, Madam Chair and Professor Weiberg. So how about in the last eight, 10 years, have you been monitoring, say, the prescription quantities of opioids and things of that nature and is that part of the scope at all of what you're looking at? Dr. Weiber. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bierman, uh, it is because um, <clears throat> the legislature, uh, oh, the legislation was passed probably in 2007. I mentioned earlier we established the prescription monitoring program in 2010 based on that legislation and we've been collecting data uh, for all controlled substance prescriptions, including opiates, that are dispensed on an outpatient basis uh, in Minnesota. And that includes any uh, controlled substance prescriptions that are dispensed into the state from those out-of-state mail-order pharmacies I mentioned. So we've been collecting that data since uh, 2010, and we've been making it available to the permissible users since April of 2010. Uh, now, the Maybe a key word I mentioned was outpatient. So this is the um, opiates or other controlled substance that would be dispensed by a pharmacy or maybe the discharge pharmacy in a hospital. Mm -hmm. We don't collect data on the uh, opioids or controlled substances that are used on an inpatient basis within a hospital. And we don't collect data on drugs that are administered, for example, in a clinic, a doc you know, a doctor's office or a dentist office or an outpatient surgery center when they're administered. So what we collect is just what's basically dispensed to be taken home and used. Okay, and last question. All right, and if you could, because we're trying to move oh. to the next presentation. Okay, so I'm just wondering if there were, you know, any investigations on quantities or repeat orders in specific locations across the state at all. Dr. Madam Weiber. Chair, Representative Bierman, um, we don't, we don't mine the PMP data, if you will, um, to try to identify. Um, prescribers or pharmacists that are over prescribing. In fact, the PMP statutes would prohibit us from mining it to um, look at prescribing practices. What we do though, in terms of pharmacists, is uh, we do um, investigate complaints about inappropriate dispensing. We don't get many of those, especially not now, these days. Uh, many of the large pharmacy chains are have really uh, developed internal policies to make their pharmacists use the PMP and to more thoroughly question uh, prescriptions. But I would say, oh, between five to 10 years ago, we would every once in a while get a complaint uh, from uh, usually um, a loved one of a, of a patient alleging that the pharmacy had been ignoring obvious signs of, of uh, abuse and just filling prescriptions. We, we really haven't had one like that for quite some time. Um, just within the last year or two, the other health licensing boards that license prescribers, they now have the authority, if they have a bona fide complaint uh, that uh, indicates that a prescriber is over-prescribing, they don't have direct access to PMP data, but they can request that data from us. And they do request that data right. from us. Thank you, Dr. Weiberg. And this is, um, Representative Bierman, this is all really interesting, important. It takes us just a little bit off our, where we want to go today, but this is something we definitely should revisit at, an, at another time. So, Dr. Weiberg, thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to ask um, Dr. Schonelmeyer to come up. And while he's doing that, I know there are a lot of visitors in the room today, folks that aren't normally here, and I just want to say that there are plenty of seats, it looks like to me. And please take a moment to find seats and, you know, um, fill in where there's room. Um, and also, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that Representative Grunhagen says he'd give up his seat. <laughs> uh, maybe we should hold him to that, huh? 
Uh, but anyway, please do take a moment to fill in while we're getting the next presentation ready uh, and make yourselves comfortable. And then um, I know that it is pharmacy day here at the, at the uh, Capitol, and I want to welcome all of you who are visiting here for pharmacy day. It's great that we have Dr. Schonelmeyer here on a day when, when you're all here. If you're here for pharmacy day, would you just raise your hand and let us know? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you very much for being here today. We, we enjoy seeing everybody. And Dr. Schondelmeyer, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and do this presentation. We are very anxious to hear what you have to say. And sorry we picked such a terrible snowy day for you. But right. um, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead and give us your presentation. And, yes. and members, and excuse me one second. We will try to let Dr. Schondelmeyer get through his presentation. But what we like to do is if there are... Um, Dr. Schandelmeyer, if there are places where you can kind of pause for questions, let us know what they are. And otherwise, members, we will try to um, only ask questions if there's something that needs clarification. You know, what does that acronym mean or something like that? And let him get through chunks of his presentation before we interrupt with questions, because I know we will have a lot of them. So please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your patience and indulgence today. And I. Thank my colleague, Dr. Weiberg, for uh, jumping in and uh, getting started first. Um, committee members, Madam Chair, I'm here to kind of dialogue with you about the pharmaceutical marketplace. We need drugs. We all use them, need them. They help our lives. But they cause problems, too. And we need to help encourage this marketplace to work well and uh, work for us. And Dr. Schondelmeyer, yes. could you just like state your name for the record? I'm just sorry, give yeah. us your institutional affiliation because we are I recording and you know, for posterity, they won't, they won't know who's speaking. I appreciate that. I, I'm Steve Schondelmeyer. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. Uh, uh, my area is pharmaceutical management and economics. I've studied the pharmaceutical market for about 45 years. Uh, my background includes being a pharmacist, an economist, uh, master's in public policy, and then working with government at all levels and with players and payers in the marketplace at all levels. Uh, and it's a fascinating marketplace. I'm here today representing my own uh, views and experience, uh, not as an official representative of the university per se. Uh, I always like to give an overview, as my students would know, of kind of what uh, I will cover. And I have a, a lot of slides, and I may skip past a few of those also, so we can have that dialogue. But my goal is to help us understand the pharmaceutical marketplace. First of all, the demand for prescription drugs. Second, drug markets. And the pharmaceutical market is not a singular market. They're really multiple markets with at least three major categories. Brand name drugs function very differently than generic drugs, and generic and brands function very differently from what we're calling biologicals or specialty drugs today. And within each of those, there's some variation. So it's not a one-size-fits-all marketplace for pharmaceuticals. And then coverage of drugs. How do we access and pay for drugs? And most people are fortunate enough to have some type of insurance coverage covered by their employer or by a government program that helps with the elderly or the indigent or special needs populations. Uh, so many people have coverage, and those coverage processes create rules and uh, issues. Then we've seen in the last decade or, or more what I would call extraordinary price changes in the pharmaceutical marketplace. And by extraordinary, I don't mean commendable. Uh, I mean prices where a drug has gone up more than 100% overnight. Now, I don't, I don't think you in the legislature get 100% increase in your stipends overnight, usually. Uh, in fact, you have to fight hard to get any change in your stipend. Uh, but we've seen drug prices go up 100% overnight. And these aren't just isolated cases. When it started happening, people reacted and said, oh, that's just a few drugs, a few cases. They keep happening, and, and I keep tracking these. I track the entire market to, to find these. And then pharmacy benefit managers are an important part of this complex web that's here. And you'll see in a minute I have a, what I call the spaghetti slide, where all these pieces go together and are all tangled up. 
uh, PBMs are important, but they have developed such an important role, such a critical role, and such a complex role that it's easy to hide things within their operations. And some of their behaviors, uh, whether it was intentional or not, end up causing harm, I think, in the marketplace. And we need to manage and regulate in a way that, that they're responsive and accountable, uh, and yet they can still do their business and still make a reasonable return and, and a profit as well. As well. And then uh, both with manufacturers as well as with PBMs, we've seen this competition and market power grow so that the ones at the top really use that market power and they've developed systems that create what I call reverse perverse economics. And I'll give some examples of that a little later in my talk. So my goal, though, is to help us, and I think your goal as a legislature, is to find fixes for the future. Uh, I think that there, we do have market failures in the pharmaceutical marketplace, but we need to find fixes that help shape and put boundaries around how the game is played so that it's open and even and we don't have one group taking advantage of another, even to the point where it affects the very life and health of a patient. And that does happen. Uh, I'm sure you've had already uh, in the legislature last year and, and in previous years examples of patients or families of patients come in and tell how the system led to the death of their loved one. Uh, patients on insulin, patients on opioids, patients on other drugs that get misused because of the system and the way this works. Uh, and I would remind you we have a variety of fixes. Legislation is one that you enact. Regulation follows on after the legislation. Uh, litigation also occurs and helps to shape the marketplace. And consumers and people in the market also are important with indignation. When they get upset enough, they'll come tell you. They'll call your office. They'll let you know, I'm frustrated. I need some help here. You need to help shape this market. So I'll remind us again, and I, you probably heard me say this before. Is there anybody here that's never been sick a day in your life? Raise your hand. Let, let me see. There's not. Second, is there anyone who has not needed or used a prescription drug ever in your life? Now, don't give us any HIPAA information, but anybody that's <laughs> never used a drug in your life, raise your hand. I ask these questions because I want us to remember virtually everyone needs, has used, or will use drugs in their lifetime. There's a universal demand for prescription drugs. We're not talking about a luxury good here that you know, a few people, you know, just the billionaires can afford. Uh, we're talking about something that every person in Minnesota, every person in society needs, needs to use, needs to have access to, and their health and life will be different if they don't have access to these medications. So this is a universal demand, uh, and that puts drugs in a, a unique economic sphere. It really makes them much like a public good. There are monopolies. There's a universal demand, it affects life and health, and there are major monopolistic behaviors in the marketplace that affect the market. Now I would point out we've seen some disruptive behaviors coming in the marketplace, and we will see more, but they haven't solved all the problems of the marketplace. Some of these behaviors may help, some of these have caused additional problems. So what do I mean by disruptive behaviors? One, we keep looking at the drug spend, and you'll see data out of the Office of the Actuary at, at the um, HHS in Washington that says we spend 10 or 11 percent of our health care uh, expenditures on drugs. And the number they report is true. Most people don't read the footnote. That's only outpatient retail prescription drugs. That doesn't include drugs in the hospital, drugs administered in the doctor's office, drugs administered in outpatient clinics. And Today, most of the new drugs are being administered in doctor's offices, outpatient clinics. Today, 40% or more of all of the drug spend we have is in places other than the 10 or 11% that gets reported. Now, the Office of the Actuary does a good job, and they report the definition, but health economists and policymakers don't look behind the scenes to see we're really spending about 18 to 20% of our total health care costs on drugs, not 10 or 11 percent. And the fastest growing part is the part that's hidden, that you don't see, the specialty drugs in the physician's office, the outpatient clinic, or other settings. 
Second, rebates have become a major issue. And rebates, on the one hand, you think, well, rebates, if we get a bigger rebate, then that means we're going to save more money, right? Well, not exactly. Uh, in fact, more rebates, in my experience, often getting more rebates means you're spending more in order to get rebates back. Uh, first of all, think about the way the rebate program works uh, with the Medicaid program. Basically, rebates mean that the state overpays the drug company by some amount and then has to keep track of all the prescriptions filled in Medicaid and then send a bill to the manufacturer and collect back the overpayment nine to 12 months later, interest free. Now, is that the way a CFO would set up a cash flow management system? The rebate system is the worst possible way to manage our cash flow in uh, drugs, to overpay and then try to collect it and do it interest free and nine to 12 months later. Uh, if, why don't we just give discounts up front? So some people have gotten to the point today where they say, let's eliminate rebates. In fact, rebates used to be viewed as kickbacks and illegal, but the uh, Office of the Inspector General and HHS put out safe harbor rules that says we'll look the other way because we think rebates can help the market. And for a while they did, but I think rebates have become uh, a reverse perverse behavior. You might have heard and noticed that uh, the federal government has proposed changing the way that Medicare Part B drugs are paid for. Now, Part B drugs are the drugs that the doctor administers in the office. And the complaint there was the doctor gets the average selling price plus 6%. Now, and uh, this is not to disparage doctors, but it's to say the economic market works. If you're making a decision and you have two drugs in front of you, one that costs $1,000 and one that costs $2,000, and they both work equally well and have the same side effect profile, same efficacy profile, uh, and you're thinking now, how will this affect my practice or what is my office manager going to tell me about prescribing? The $1,000 drug or the $2,000? And you get paid 6% of the cost of the drug. So 6% of $1,000, okay? 6% of $2,000. Which drug are you going to prescribe based on your economic interest? You'll prescribe the higher cost drug. And in fact, we've seen in Medicare Part B that physicians often do prescribe the higher cost drugs uh, even if they're not the best drug, even if they're not the safest, most effective drug. Not always, but it has affected the prescribing behaviors. So hold that thought about getting a percentage of the drug cost, and it has an incentive to raise the cost. Now let's turn to PBMs and rebates. Most people think the battle with PBMs and rebates is getting the rebate passed through. And that is an issue. It should be on the table. But I think the bigger issue is PBMs also get a rebate administration fee. That's not a rebate. It's a percentage of the costs of the drugs that are being paid for. Just like the doctors prescribing oncology drugs, if you can favor one drug versus another and you can favor a higher cost drug versus a lower cost drug, you get more rebates back, but it means that the employer or the plan sponsor has to pay more up front but they don't know that. What they can tell the plan sponsor is, we'll give you a 30% rebate, and we won't even charge you a dispensing fee, and uh, we'll give you back uh, $5 per prescription in rebates. Uh, sounds like a good deal. But what is happening sometimes is the drug that's preferred is a brand name that costs $500 instead of an exact generic equivalent that costs $50. And so if you pay $500 up front, sure, they'll give you half of that back or a third of that back. But you've overpaid $500 versus $50. You've overpaid by $450, and you're only going to get part of that back. So more rebates doesn't help you when you're overpaying for the drug in the first place. And it doesn't always happen in PBMs and rebates, but it sometimes happens, and sometimes happens in a very uh, perverse way. Copay coupons and patient assistance programs. Again, this is something that looks great on the surface and sometimes does help patients. I fully acknowledge that. But a coupon, sometimes uh, many of the coupons that drug manufacturers offer for prescription drugs are for generics and brands. It's for the brand version when a generic's available. 
Again, the brand may cost $500, the exact generic equivalent that the FDA's reviewed and says is exact therapeutic equivalent costs $50, but the coupon is only good for the $500 drug. The patient doesn't have to pay the copay, so the patient at the moment saves, but the plan sponsor has to pay the uh, for the $500 drug, and the patient saved $10, $20, $30. At the end, though, the cost of that plan sponsor goes up the next year, their experience rating goes up, and they have to raise the premiums. And so, really, the patient didn't save in the long run. Premiums are also an out-of-pocket cost. Don't forget that. It's not just how much you paid when you were at the counter or in the pharmacy or at the doctor's office, but the premium is also an out-of-pocket cost. So, co-pays uh, sometimes, often, create reverse perverse economics. And, in fact, the copay coupons are illegal in the Medicare and Medicaid program. The government has said they are kickbacks and they're Ill illegal, yet we allow them in the commercial market. Why, why is it good for the commercial market if it's not good for Medicare and Medicaid? I, I think we should consider uh, outlawing the copay coupons and uh, if the manufacturers want to help the patients with their drug costs, give them a discount up front. Don't, don't make them wait. Uh, to collect it or don't make them overpay uh, and have higher premiums down the line. Generics have been one of the major ways that we've saved money in the pharmaceutical market over the last three decades. They really have brought a lot of benefit to the market. But even generics have done things that we don't expect. I can show you generics. Uh, there's a whole set of generic drugs. I have a slide later that shows the uh, action. There's a whole set of generic manufacturers that got together and said, hey, the brand names keep raising their prices and we keep getting pushed down. If we all just wink, wink, do the right thing, we can raise our prices and get away with it. And there is a lawsuit uh, started by the former attorney general from Minnesota and continuing and other states have joined in that against a large number of generic companies for raising prices. And these were prices that were extraordinary. They more than doubled overnight. Uh, they went up more than double overnight for generic prices. So. Generic, and then we also have what's called pay for delay in the generic market, where a generic company finds a product and they challenge the brand name to get on the market earlier, and the brand name comes to them and says, you know, we're making a lot of profit and we'll share some of that with you if you'll just agree not to come in the marketplace and wait for three or five years or something. And so they pay them to delay their entry, and the brand name does well on the way to the bank. The generic company does better than they would have if they actually marketed the drug, but who gets hurt? The consumer, Medicare, Medicaid, government programs, uh, employers, uh, those of us who pay the bills at the end of the day. We've talked about PBM behavior. Uh, I'll show some examples in a minute. And then the opioid crisis is a part of this too. Uh, we have a healthcare system that encourages what we call adherence. And, and I'm all for patients using the medicines as they're supposed to. But the measures we use for adherence simply measure what we call medication possession ratio. Did we send enough drug to the patient's house that they could have used it as they were supposed to if they wanted to? But the systems we have rarely check on true compliance or adherence. Uh, we fill up patients' medicine cabinets. Uh, I've seen time after time patients' medicine cabinets with literally hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of drug that go to waste because they got shipped too much from an automatic shipment program from the mail order or from an automatic refill program. And those drugs then come back to these take-back programs we have. Uh, it's been estimated that anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of all the drugs we dispense come back through those waste programs. And that means we're overpaying. We paid for those expensive drugs, and now we're dumping them in the trash, and we're worried about how to dispose of them. So again, and some of those leak out into the market uh, through gray areas or become drugs that get abused or misused in the market. <laughs> now keep in mind, this is not a normal market. First of all, a drug company must have an approval from the FDA for a drug to get on the market. And the only criteria Congress has established is that the drug has to be better than placebo. FDA is not required to compare it to the standard therapy or to the optimal therapy, but only to placebo. And that's a, a very minimal standard. Second, once a drug is covered, 
our Congress has now passed laws that say once it's approved by the FDA, you have to cover it under Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, it would be difficult for a Medicare and Medicaid program not to cover a drug. The drug firm then knows it has to be, it's approved, it has to be covered. I can set the price at anything I want. It's like a blank check. You know, here it is, uh, just fill in the amount and send it off to the government. Our coverage has also broadened. We have in the past few years brought more people into coverage for health care in general and prescription drugs in particular. But we've also told our Medicaid program, which is the, our Medicare, which is the largest single buyer of drugs in the world, we've told them, you can't negotiate prices. Now, how many of you would start a business and not negotiate for the prices of the goods and services you're going to acquire? It would be foolish. You would go bankrupt really quick. And that's the struggle. Our Medicaid program, they're handcuffed. They're told you can't negotiate prices. You can't do anything. Now, that's not a simple process either, but we need to address that. Uh, and now we see as really expensive drugs come out, patients have increased cost sharing. Uh, we see the drug costs being shifted to the individual or the employer or the government program. Those are the end payers. Let me remind you, there are a lot of people who will come to the table and tell you they are payers in health care. Many of them are simply transaction processors. We need them. They provide valuable roles, but a health plan, an insurance company, a PBM doesn't pay with their own money for those drugs. They're paying with the patient's money, they're paying with an employer's money, or with the government's money. The end payers are government, employers, individuals. Everybody else is a processor. We need them. We need to work with them, but we need to make sure they work for the end payer in the long run. Uh, insurance does not increase the amount of resources we have in the system. In fact, it takes some out. They provide valuable services. We pay them for that. But sometimes they may take uh, excess amounts out. Uh, it's a type of income redistribution. So basically, we have a market with monopolies, high barriers to entry, not easy to move uh, resources around, uh, reverse perverse economics. And don't forget also, prescription drugs aren't like buying a color TV or a new suit. Uh, I can go anywhere I want to buy a new suit or a color TV. I can't walk into a pharmacy and say, I want this prescription drug. I have to have a permission slip. And that permission slip has to come from the doctor, has to follow certain rules, has to follow the rules of the Board of Pharmacy, and the pharmacy has to follow certain rules. This is a market that's highly regulated, highly uh, has high oversight at all levels, except one or two. We don't have any process in our federal government that tracks drug prices and policy issues and, and problems with policy issues uh, on an ongoing basis. We don't have any agency or anybody that does regular oversight and regulates the pharmaceutical benefit managers. So we've got a couple of parts of the market that are in a highly regulated industry, but they themselves aren't regulated like other businesses, like insurance companies, like pharmacies, like physicians, like hospitals. Uh, and we need, I'm not saying let's beat up the PBMs or drug companies, we need them. But we need to have rules that everybody plays with and stays within. Dr. Schantelmeyer, would yes. this be a good moment to pause? I have it a would. couple of members with questions. Certainly. And you've covered a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And it, it's, it's fascinating, and there, there's an awful lot here. Um, yes. But I want to go to Representative Munson. I know you had raised your hand when Dr. Weiberg was up, but do you still have a question now? Um. <laughs> Uh, no, Madam Chair, it was answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, Representative Halverson. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I really appreciate kind of hearing where the challenges are. Um, it's, it's very, uh, uh, I think, illustrative to see where the consumers are being left behind in, in the market. Um, and I don't think we can really call it a market if people can't shop it. Right. So <laughs> I think it's a misnomer. Um, but I'm wondering um, if, if, I'm remembering a story right, um, because I think that we're hitting on a lot of things that we need to reform with regard to um, uh, how prescription drugs and, and our pharmaceutical companies operate. And I'm remembering a story and about um, ulcer treatment um, from several years ago, and that there was actually research that was um, uh, 
suppressed so that the a drug company could keep selling the number one drug on the on the prescription market. Is that am I remembering that right? Uh, I don't recall the ulcer story, but there are a number of drugs where that's occurred. That happened with thyroid drugs. Uh, it's it's happened in a number of therapeutic categories where, much like the tobacco industry did with smoking, and no, it doesn't cause cancer. We don't see anything. Uh, there are times, uh, Vioxx, for example, was a, an anti-inflammatory drug that was used, uh, and the drug company there knew that it was causing deaths in some patients, and they didn't report it to FDA, and um, didn't report it to doctors. And so the drug companies often know more about their drug than anyone else, but they are supposed to report it, and they don't always do so. And so we suffer because of that, and, and there are many cases like that. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Have there been pub have there been follow ups on public policy to um, deal with those kinds of issues when they come up or not? I don't. I haven't heard anything. Dr. Well, Schondelmeyer. Thank you for the question, uh, and Madam Chair and, and uh, Representative Halverson. The, the uh, there are follow ups. I had uh, one of my graduate students finish not only a doctorate of pharmacy but a law degree, and she uh, her dissertation was about. Uh, cases where drug companies had been sued over a variety of behaviors, and, and she looked to see what were the penalties and were they sufficient to deter the behavior. And the conclusion was when they did get identified, uh, the vast majority end up in a settlement, uh, and the penalties or the payments were not sufficient at all to deter the behavior. Uh, and so uh, we need to change something about how this is working. Litigation is a tool we can use. But if the litigation doesn't result in sufficient penalties to change behavior, uh, it, it doesn't really help a lot. Okay, thank you. And I, um, I think you could continue, please. Okay. So I'm jumping into a couple of examples. I'm sure we all remember or have heard about the EpiPen. Uh, and these are, these are not just list prices. I help manage the drug benefit at the University of Minnesota. These are the prices we paid actually paid for EpiPens at the University of Minnesota from 2005 through 2016. Uh, do you notice a trend line here? <laughs> okay. And again, uh, have consumers had their salaries increase at this rate? Have, have, has the legislature uh, had an excess of funds uh, growing at this rate? No. EpiPen, and EpiPen literally is a drug that's about life and death. Uh, and it brought mothers and concerned families and parents uh, out of the woodwork. Uh, another drug that we've all heard about recently also, uh, well, actually, there was going to be a new competitor come on the market, AviQ. It did come on the market. So instead of being $730 on the, uh, a piece, when it did get on the market, it was $4,500 for a two-pack. Now, is that competition to go from $730 to $4,500? Is that the way competition works? Did you learn that in Econ 101? If you did, I want to talk to the professor because it doesn't work that way. Uh, other, this slide looks like the same data, but it isn't. This is how much our cost of humulin insulin went up from 2005 to 2013, and this trend line has continued up as well. And these are costs of monthly prescriptions, but if we... But the annualized cost, even in 2014, insulin was costing more than $10,000 per year. And today, we're up over $16,000, $17,000 a year uh, for a patient. That's sixteen dollars or $17,000 a year. The poverty line is about $15,000 a year. So somebody at the poverty line, if they used all their resources, could afford their insulin, but nothing else. No food, no water, no housing, um, nothing else. No transportation. Uh, so, uh, Humulin is another example that we've heard about, and again, the market hasn't corrected this. This is a, a very important drug. Now, remember I told you earlier about generics that went up? I looked at the cohort of generics that came on the market from 1980 to 2003, and I looked at their prices. From 2005, notice they were going down in price from 71 cents a unit down to 48 cents a unit. Then there was a bump up in 2011. But in 2013 and 14, they jumped from 48 cents a unit all the way up to $1.26 per unit. Now, that sounds like, a, 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 you know, we're doing it in dollars and cents, 
But when you start doing that as a patient across hundreds of doses, or you start doing that as a Medicaid program across millions of doses, this turns out to be real money. And why did it double in price? What justified that? How do we hold the drug companies accountable for that? If your heating bill doubles in price, we have a rate regulation commission that can call the utilities in and hold them accountable and ask, please explain to us how that happened. Maybe we should have such an oversight process for pharmaceuticals to hold companies accountable. They can set their price, but they have to explain it in a rational, believable way to someone who understands it. And then once they've done that, uh, if it's judged that they're excessively taking advantage of their market power, then maybe some corrective action is needed. I wouldn't do it with everybody. Now think about it, when a drug goes up 100% in price, does the patient's diabetes get 100% better? No, it's the same drug, but it costs you twice as much and it does the same thing. Now, it's a miraculous drug, it's worth a lot, it's, it's priceless, but we can't pay a priceless amount for every drug in the economy. And um, if I could just pause you here, uh, yes. Representative Grunhagen has a question. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for the excellent presentation, okay? Very insightful. I've sold health insurance since 1978, so I've mm -hmm. seen a number of presentations about drug price, health care costs. This is one of the best. Um, you know, just back to the insulin graph, has the number of, you know, I, I'm a free market uh, economics believer, and to me, the more competition, the better the price delivered to consumers. So my question is, has the number of companies that offer insulin decreased or increased over the last decade or two? And if so, if it's decreased, is that from your perspective part of the reason they can do what they're doing? In other words, do we only have a few companies offering this product and actually an increase in competition would accomplish quite a bit in terms of uh, bringing the price down? Yeah. Dr. Schondelmeyer. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you, and, and Representative, uh, I will try to address your question. Um, first, I would say I believe in markets as well. Uh, but my experience in studying the pharmaceutical, healthcare in general, and pharmaceuticals in particular, in the last 45 years are, there are structural features that prohibit that market from working as we would expect. With respect to insulin, uh, there are only three manufacturers of that drug. Uh, and they really don't compete on price. In fact, you saw what happened. Yep. All three of them have gone up at about the same rate. They follow each other up. Yeah. So this is a marketplace that's so concentrated. And again, a patient can come into your office to buy health insurance. And if you have four or five different lines of insurance, they could choose any one of those yep. with your advice. But a patient who needs insulin has to have a permission slip from the doctor for a specific type of insulin. And they can't go in and say, oh, I want to change the insulin today, give me a different one. Uh, so this is a marketplace that has structural barriers that we don't experience in the rest of the market. And so without some gentle holding and setting of rules for the marketplace to work better, I don't think it will ever work like a normal competitive market that we're used to and that we uh, applaud. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And on the next page, you show that graph about <coughs> retail prices yes. on generic drugs. And uh, it just seems like when Obamacare was implemented, it seems like the prices took off. Was there something structural in the Obamacare law that allowed this type of behavior? Dr. Sean From your Harris. perspective? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, no, I don't believe that this was related to the Obamacare. Uh, I did a study back in 2007 and 8, and there were also uh, huge jumps in generic prices. And I'd done previous studies back in 2000. And we see every 8 to 10 years, we see some bulges like this because the market doesn't correct for it. They get away with it. Nobody notices. Now at least we're looking, and there are people like myself who say, hey, look, there is something happening, uh, but we still haven't done anything to change it. Okay. All right, please continue. So the next point is this slide, and it's too detailed to see. All I want you to look at, this is the market for multiple sclerosis drugs. These are brand name drugs. 
These drugs back uh, when they, the first one or two came in the market, uh, their cost was rather inexpensive, and they were down around uh, uh, about $10,000 per year of therapy. Now, notice we've gone from one or two in the market to about six or eight drugs. Did the prices go down as we had more competitors? The question you were asking, did the prices go down when we had more competitors? No, they went up, and they went up even faster. So we're up over sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 per year of therapy for multiple sclerosis. Now, I'm all for finding therapies to treat multiple sclerosis. I'm all for paying for them under Medicare and Medicaid and commercial plans. But with a marketplace like this and the prices going up, and these drugs are helpful, but these aren't, these don't cure multiple sclerosis. They're just symptomatic therapy, and, and I wouldn't take them away from anyone. But are they worth this price? Why isn't this market working? This is supposed to be a market where the prices go down with more competitors, and all we've seen is the prices going up. Uh, then I would also point out, this is the new cancer drugs that have come in the marketplace from 1965 to 2013. Now, the first thing, let me point out the left-hand scale is a logarithmic scale. Mm -hmm. Even though this looks kind of gradual and linear, that's a logarithmic scale, which really means the scale is more like straight up. Uh, and this is the cost of new cancer drugs. Again, I'm all for finding drugs to treat cancer and uh, resolve it and for rewarding innovation in manufacturers. But even oncologists have been questioning cancer drugs that cost three and four hundred thousand dollars a year and extend the patient's life by a month or two. Is it worth that? What do we do with that? Question from Representative Halverson. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, looking at this and looking at, um, you know, new drugs coming on the market, very often we hear that it's because of research and development. But my question uh, to you is, is there a way for us to find out what the taxpayer investment is on research and development? Because I know that our universities are involved in research and development. The NIH is involved in research and development. Um, and that doesn't seem to ever enter in as part of the equation. So can we find out? Yeah. Dr. Schonholmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Halverson. Yes, there are studies that have looked at that over time at various points in time. There's not a continuous feedback of information. Uh, but we know that we have a number of drugs on the market today uh, because the NIH has brought them, uh, discovered them, and then passed them off to a pharmaceutical company partner. We need that partnership. But there have been questions about for example, the licensure rates, when a NIH licenses a drug out to a drug company, they don't seem to be market-based licensure rates. Uh, there, there are one or two companies who have had a lot of products licensed out of NIH, and their former, uh, their research director at that drug company uh, was formerly the NIH director. So they kind of, the revolving door, you know, you, you get a, a, you know, we, I'm not saying anything's wrong, but it does look suspicious. Uh, and, in fact, that company, at least, uh, I looked about seven or eight years ago, and of all the cancer drugs that company had on the market, how many had they discovered in-house? Zero. They all had been licensed in from venture capital firms, NIH, other sources. So, yes, there's a cost of research and development, but our market doesn't really hold the, uh, the, the players accountable for what are they producing with that R&D. One can be a very inefficient research and development company in this market because it's so loose and so generous. And in fact, I would argue that it's beginning to work in a way that high-priced drugs are penalizing innovation. Because a drug, company, a drug company can spend time finding a combination of two drugs and get a patent on it and sell them at brand name prices. And it's a lot cheaper to, to make a combination of two old drugs than it is to find a true new therapeutic advance. For example, there's a drug, uh, you probably have all heard of uh, uh, Prilosec mm -hmm. for uh, the bad pizza you had last night for, for your ulcers. And, Zeg, and there's a sodium bicarbonate. There. So there's a company that combines sodium bicarbonate with Prilosec. They call it Zegrid. It's a trade name. You can actually buy it over the counter for $23 for 42 tablets. But as a prescription drug, this drug cost about $17,000 for a 90-day supply. Oh, my gosh. And you may say, oh, Shonamari, that can't be. How did I find it? 
we were paying claims at the university for patients who had that drug prescribed. As soon as I found it, I contacted my PBM and said, A, why didn't you tell me this was coming through? And B, let's put a block on it so we don't pay for it anymore. But this is an old drug. This is not anything new, but they're charging $17,000 for a drug that you can buy for $23. But the market, it works. It, things slip through the market because it's so loose. I just want a quick follow-up. Uh, do you want to tell us what sodium bicarbonate is for home cooks? Uh -huh. Sodium bicarbonate? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's soda, basically. Baking yeah. soda. Baking soda. And it costs yeah. pennies. And I just wanted to make sure that was on the record. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we have a question from um, Representative Ocrom, <coughs> and then I'm going to ask members to kind of hold questions because we've got a lot left here, and I really want to make sure that Dr. Schondelmeyer can get through because I'm especially interested in hearing some of the recommendations. So. Representative Acom, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and Doctor. I have a question. You were talking about the MS drugs, and yes. um, my husband has multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. and and so as you <coughs> said, many of the medications are symptom management or trying to slow the progression. And so my my question for you is around some of the prior authorizations that are needed and the barriers to patients from actually getting the medications that their doctors feel might actually help them. Maybe can you speak to that at all? Dr. Shondelmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, uh, prior authorizations are a, a challenging area. It's a utilization management tool. Uh, any tool that we have in public policy can be used well and it can be used poorly. I've seen both with prior authorization. Prior authorization used well is used in a way that if a drug has safety concerns, we make sure that the patient is using it in a safe way, has access to it, uh, and uses the resources of the plan well. If it's used poorly, the, the PBM or managed care plan can make prior authorization a hassle factor. We can make it really painful for the doctor and the nurse and the pharmacist to call and get it covered, or for the patient. You know, you go into the pharmacy, they're told, oh, that's not covered, you have to go back to your doctor, you have to have the doctor call the PBM, you have to have the pharmacist call the PBM. It can be used well, it can be used poorly. Uh, so I think this is a case where we need to look at the rules again around how prior authorization to, should work. What are the goals? Is it done in a timely manner? Does it have rational criteria? Are the criteria explicit so people know up front what they are? Uh, and if it's used properly, it's a good thing. But it can get in the way and really make life miserable. Thank you. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Representative Munson had a question. I'm going to go to you because I didn't let you ask before, but then we're going to let Dr. Schondelmeyer finish. That's all right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And a question for Dr. Schondelmeyer. Uh, I did remember one from earlier. Um, it was a question about how, if we were to change the rules on the federal level to allow reimportation of drugs from other countries, would how what would the impact of that be to the pharmaceutical market? And I understand there may be. Uh, some safety issues, safety concerns, some importing from certain countries, but uh, could you speak to that idea and how it would impact our market? Dr. Yeah. Schondelmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, a good question. I've dealt with and examined that issue for many years. I worked with uh, uh, U.S. Representative Gut uh, uh, Gutnick from uh, Rochester. I worked with Paul Wellstone, with many players from many parties. Uh, importation can help. In the European market, they have what's called parallel imports, where you can buy products from other markets. And parallel imports make the market work. It, it brings price pressure. Uh, with drugs, safety can be a concern. But our US FDA has spent decades harmonizing their regulations with Canada and the European Union. In other words, making sure they have the same process and the same regulation. And they accept data from each other's countries. Uh, and their regulations are largely harmonized. If there was a drug I needed, personally, that was on the market in Europe or Canada, uh, and it was available at a lower cost and I was living in that country or had easy access to it, I would have no hesitation in using that drug. There are, as you pointed out, a few countries where one would be more cautious. I probably wouldn't use drugs from Mexico. I probably wouldn't use drugs from Southeast Asia or uh, the Latin American or African continents just because of the way their markets work right now. But there are markets where we can trust the drugs essentially like we do the U.S. drugs. The question then is, does that help the problem? 
There are uh, bills in the U.S. Congress to allow reimportation from Canada. Canada is convenient, it's a close border, and theoretically that would help. But here's the issue with Canada. They have one-tenth of the number of people that we do. If our U.S. Congress suddenly said, okay, you can reimport drugs from Canada, there would be a big sucking sound from the South taking all the drugs out of the Canadian market, and don't you think their parliament would get together and say, no, we're not going to allow that. So it's one of those easy solutions that probably won't work because it would overwhelm the Canadian system and do harm to them. Uh, so I think if we're going to do it, we need to have more than just Canada. We need the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, a few countries that we've harmonized with. If we do that, that will help. I think it'll bring some pressure to lower the prices in the U.S. and the prices in those other countries will go up some. So we're not going to get the lowest prices that are out there, but we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And since we're so much bigger, it's probably more toward our side of the middle than their side of the middle, but it would help some. Uh, but in the long run, the largest wholesaler in the U.S. is the largest wholesaler in Canada. It's the largest wholesaler in Europe. Don't you think they know how to distribute drugs on a worldwide market? And in fact, we have laws that require track and trace, that the manufacturer, through the wholesaler all the way down the line, they have to be able to track that individual pill and say, here's where it started and here's all the places it stopped along the way, and this is a valid drug. So I, I think we can manage the safety, we can manage uh, the market, but we will rankle our uh, colleagues in other countries if we did that, because their drug costs will go up. Um, we have been rankling our friends around the world recently anyway, so uh, <laughs> might as well add one more thing to the list. And Dr. Schondelmeyer, before you go on, I just want to let, let everybody who's in the room know that there are more copies of the presentation there if you didn't get one. Thank you. So uh, please pick one up on the way out or now <coughs> if you'd like. Please continue. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to remind us that there are drugs today that come on the market that have either a monthly or an annual cost that are staggering. They may cost the same as a week's vacation, assuming you spend $1,000 to $5,000 for a week's vacation. There are drugs that cost the same as an economy car, a whole car, not rental for a day, buying a whole new economy car. There are drugs that cost the same as a new luxury car. Covering some of these drugs, uh, we could pass out new luxury cars to the patients that are covered for the same price or maybe even less. And there are drugs today that cost more than a brand new house in a nice neighborhood. We don't pass out brand new houses. We are concerned about housing. We need to do some things with housing. But we don't pass out brand new houses or luxury cars. We find public transportation and public housing. And we haven't dealt with drugs in the healthcare market in the same way. It's getting out of proportion. The market is not working. I've already talked about the generics and some pricing issues there. I would just point out that the annual family income and individual income, the average, uh, the median per person income is around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year, and the median household income is around fifty-three to sixty-five thousand dollars a year, depending on which data set you look at. Given all of that, the cost of a new specialty drug, uh, first of all, a generic, will cost you about $480 a year. A brand name will cost you a, up, up to about $5,000 a year. So those are affordable within most households. They stretch a lot of people, but they're affordable. But then if we go to the specialty drugs we've talked about, they average, and this is data that's several years old, they average $50,000 plus per year. That means it would suck up all of the income and resources of a household. Everything. They wouldn't have anything left for housing and food and shelter, or, um, uh, other things, education, other things. So let's shift to a minute. Uh, this is that spaghetti map I talked about. There are a lot of players, and I apologize, I've actually oversimplified this uh, <laughs> to share it with you and so we could read all the lines. But basically, this talks about two things, where drugs flow through the system and where money flows through the system. And the two aren't always the same. Uh, but we've also seen uh, aggregation of power in a few spots. And in fact, it's even, I don't even have represented here the newest trend, 
which is the trend for an insurance company and a PBM and a chain of pharmacies and a specialty pharmacy and a mail order to all be owned by the same company. Insurer, PBM, preferred chain of pharmacies, specialty, mail order, and they want to keep you all in the one system. Uh, on the one hand, increasing size and volume, they could be able to help us more with buying power and, and doing things better, but they can also bully the purchasers because the purchasers aren't nearly as big as the sellers in the marketplace. And so uh, th there are concerns, questions about this new vertical integration occurring in the health system and in the pharmaceutical market in particular. Uh, it's not unusual for a pharmacy benefit manager, in fact most of them if they're successful today, they uh, do a great job of managing and processing the transactions and doing some of the prior authorizations. Some do it well, some don't, uh, and, and other types of step therapy. But they also own a mail order pharmacy. They also own a specialty pharmacy. They almost all these days, the large PBMs are aligned with or own a retail chain of pharmacies, and they make it their preferred network pharmacies, and some even require that you exclusively use their facilities. I had a, a story come to me from a news organization here in town three or four years ago about a patient who was told that, that they had to use exclusively the PBM specialty pharmacy and that the drug would cost $2,500. The patient just a month before had gotten the drug filled at a Park Nicolette clinic and paid cash for it for $250. Same drug, same cost, but the PBM wanted them to use the brand name instead of the generic uh, and said, well, your employer gave us an exclusive arrangement. You don't have any choice. You can't go to Park Nicolette again for $250. You have to come to us for $2,500. What's wrong with this picture? That's not the market working well. PBMs have done many wonderful things, but they occasionally stray in some of their behaviors. You might have heard about the gag rules. There are PBMs who told pharmacists, if the patient can buy the drug for cash cheaper than the copay, don't tell them. We want you to charge them the full copay. Pharmacists got upset with that. They said, we're here to serve our patients, not the PBM, and we want our patients to get the best deal they can. And there were PBMs who started penalizing pharmacists and pharmacies who would tell their patients, and they created what were called gag rules. Now. The federal government has said that those gag rules are inappropriate, but the government had to come along and tell them. The PBMs didn't figure it out themselves. Hey, this is not really good PR and not the way to make money. Um, PBMs also uh, help us and have encouraged and increased our generic use. But as they increased generic use, they started adding a margin on. They would pay the pharmacy $25 for the generic, turn around and bill the employer $40 or $50. They would add on a big margin. So some of the increase in generic prices is not the generic company's fault. It's the PBM adding margins on top of that that we don't know about. Now, a good sponsor or employer should contract with their PBM and say, we don't want any spread pricing. We want to pass through. But if you don't have their MAC prices, and PBMs, which is maximum allowable cost, it's a way they set the the amount that will be paid to the pharmacy for the generic and the amount that they will bill the employer. There are PBMs that have different MAC lists for what they pay the pharmacy and what they bill the employer. They have different MAC lists for their preferred network of chain pharmacies that they own than they do for the independents in your small town. They have a different MAC list for their mail order than they do for the independents in your small town. Often, not always, but I found in many cases in the Minnesota market and in the national market where PBMs pay their preferred chains more for the generic than they pay the community independents. They pay the mail order more than they pay the community independents. So don't always assume that preferred network means you're getting a better deal. Somebody's getting a better deal. It's the chain and the PBM. It's not you. Don't always assume that mail order is cheaper because it isn't. Uh, it has additional costs. Uh, rebates also, PBMs sometimes get caught up in driving rebates because remember my Medicare Part B? If you get a percentage of the cost of the drug, you don't have to keep the drug costs or make money on the drug costs, but you use higher cost drugs, you make more money. And so PBMs sometimes prefer 
higher cost brand name drugs because you make more money. So I've given you some examples of issues with PBMs that really need oversight and regulation and management. Um, we talked about Zegrid. This is the category of proton pump inhibitors. There are four or five drugs in this category. The proton pump inhibitors are like the Prilosex and Nexiums, as I said, for the bad pizza you had last night. And these drugs have exact generic equivalents that FDA has approved. And the generic equivalents cost from 10 cents to, to 50 cents uh, per unit. The brand names still cost $8 to $17. There are still patients getting the brand name products at $17 instead of a 25 cent exact generic equivalent. Why does that work? Because somebody's getting a rebate on it. Somebody's uh, getting a preferred uh, price on it, but not the patient, not the Medicaid program, not the plan sponsor. And Dr. Uh, Schondelmeyer, yes. we have, um, we actually do have one question, but we only really have a few minutes left. Members, yes. I'm thinking we will go about five minutes over, if that's okay with everybody, because we do <coughs> want to try to get more of this in if we can. And uh, Representative Newark, can you wait a few moments sure. with your question, and then we'll get to you. I really would like Dr. Schondelmeyer to get through the, um, the presentation. Okay, please continue. I want to jump to this slide. This is a slide. I've worked with Consumer Reports over time. They're a very reputable organization. Uh, they try to do what's right for consumers. And they've gone into different metropolitan areas around the country and shopped different pharmacies. And I helped them set up a market basket of five commonly used generic drugs. So they used the same five generic drugs, and they went to a whole bunch of pharmacies in metropolitan areas and check the prices. And this shows the prices for different types of pharmacy. At the very low end are the dot coms and the big box Costco. Uh, the third one over is independent retail pharmacies. In this market basket, the same five drugs cost $136 at independent pharmacies. Then we have Sam's Club, Targets, and this was Target before CVS. Uh, and then we go up the line and who's at the top? Walgreens, Rite Aid, and CVS. And the same market basket of five generics that cost $136 at the local independent pharmacy cost $600 to $855 wow. at these pharmacies. Now, these are the, which, which pharmacies on here are usually in the preferred network that you have to go to? The ones at the top end, not the ones at the bottom end. How is it, how's that helping you as an employer? How's that helping you as a patient? How does that help us in managed care Medicaid? I don't know. I think we're overpaying somewhere along the way. Um, I won't belabor this, but this is one drug at one point in time, and it's priced to different pharmacies in a network uh, uh, that were paid for by a plan sponsor. The green ones on the left were the preferred network and the amounts that were actually paid by the employer. The red bars are the amounts paid to the mail order. The blue bars are the amounts billed and paid to uh, independent community pharmacies. Who has the best price here? And yet, patients are being steered to mail order and preferred networks. Why? Because they make more money there, not because it's better for the patient. Uh, I'm not against people making money, but let's bring it out on the table and let's let us make wise choices about this uh, in the marketplace. Um, this is how the spread works. Uh, you can look at that later. I'll skip past that. Levothyroxine, the most prescribed drug in the U.S., uh, has generics that go all the way from five cents a tablet to, to three or four dollars a tablet. And sometimes mail orders or uh, various uh, pharmacy operations will dispense the four dollar drug and they'll give you a 50 cent uh, uh, rebate or a 50 percent discount. Uh, but 50 percent off of four dollars still doesn't get you down to a nickel. And these are all generically equivalent FDA-approved drugs. Um, the newest one that really rankled me, again, I watch, I'm completely HIPAA compliant. The university doesn't want me, and nor do I want to look at anything that tells me anything about an individual patient. But I do look at every de-identified prescription at the university. And I saw a year ago prescriptions coming through for sustained-release metformin. This is the, the first line of therapy for diabetes, oral therapy for diabetes. And you can buy most uh, metformin therapies for uh, 5 to $10 for a one-month supply. Or even uh, the brand name 
Uh, sustained release costs $73 for a one-month supply. But there are two new bioavailability profiles of the drug. This is drugs that are distributed a little bit different in the patient, but there's no clinical evidence that they work better. And they've come on the market at uh, several hundred dollars and one that's up almost $5,000 now. I saw in the course of two months, eight or nine claims come in for sixteen or $17,000 each that we paid and we were billed by our PBM. Again, I had the same question I had with the Zegrid. With Zegrid, I thought this is a one-off one thing. It won't happen again. Here it is again. Companies charging exorbitant prices, uh, price gouging us, and it gets through the system. I don't know why the PBM didn't find it. I hope they find the next one before I do. Uh, but we ha should have a system that's working. The market's not working, sir. This wouldn't work in a normal market. Um, so the market's not working. It all boils down to how sick are we in dollars and cents. But when some people hold all the leverage, they can charge you a lot more dollars and cents than they should. We need a system that has enough rules to make sure that we play fair. I want drug companies to be profitable and find true innovations. I want PBMs to be successful, efficient, and help us use our resources more wisely. Don't suck the resources out of the system. Help us use them wisely. The market's broken. Even President Trump has jumped into this, as you might have heard several times. He's declared, uh, you know, drug prices are outrageous. Pharmaceutical firms are getting away with murder. Uh, and his office has put out a blueprint. Now, some of the things in there won't work, but some are worth considering. Some of the things can be tweaked. And there are Democratic colleagues who also have proposals out that, that can uh, benefit the market. I want to point out one thing. Notice the light blue bars here. That's the percentage of the total revenue that drug companies report to Wall Street that is actually paid back in rebates and discounts. Do you realize if you look at the earnings of pharmaceutical companies, that more than a third of it isn't money they ever collect. It goes back out in rebates and discounts. In other words, it's kind of like those credit default swaps. We've fooled ourselves with rebates and things that are hidden in the market that aren't real cash that end up at the drug company. So it's not all the drug companies. It's a, tuss, a, tuggle, a tug between drug companies and PBMs and other players over rebates and cash flow and making it look like there's more revenue. Sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. But the system is broken. I worry that it will crash. It could crash like our banking system did a decade ago. Are there drug companies too big to fail? I worry if a, they're not, I don't want to create any rumors, but let's say if Pfizer went bankrupt, what would happen to the drugs they hold the intellectual property on? Would it go to a court and a receiver and a master would control all the drugs, but they're slow, we wouldn't have the drugs in the market? What would happen if Walgreens failed? What would happen if CVS failed. I don't want any of these to fail, but if they did, we would be in a world of hurt in terms of our healthcare system. And I don't think we have alternatives. We need to work with these players to make sure the market continues to work fairly and appropriately that sustains all of us, not just some players in the market. Um, with that, I think we need to make the market more transparent and accountable. Transparency doesn't work without accountability also and enforcement or leverage behind it. Second, we have to systematically monitor for extraordinary prices. I do this already informally. The state of Maryland passed a price gouging law for generics, and I provided them monthly with prices that were extraordinary and that they needed to check out. Their uh, law has now been challenged, and it's in a court of appeals and, and on its way to the Supreme Court eventually. But uh, they've attempted to deal with that. Um, we need to prohibit market distorting behaviors like copay coupons uh, and the gag rules and uh, undisclosed rebates and drug companies creating combinations of products that are cheap, but they can charge us $17,000 a piece, a piece for. So uh, also we need to make sure our healthcare providers have the information they need to make value based decisions. I believe that pharmacists and physicians and nurses and our healthcare systems can make very wise decisions if they have information. But I've studied this market 45 years and I have trouble finding drug prices. And I know where to look. And most physicians 
are capable of dealing with drug prices, but they don't have access to the information. And if they do have a price, it's the list price. It's not the real price. It's not the deeply discounted prices that we see and hear about. We need information to make value-based decisions. We need to change the marketplace, change the system. Uh, a number of states, and I uh, got this from the National Association of State Health um, Policy, a number of states have enacted bills. They're dealing with PBM regulation. They're dealing with transparency and accountability bills, with price gouging bills, uh, with wholesale or, or reimportation through wholesalers, not just any consumer or whatever they want, but through legitimate channels, uh, with bulk purchasing, with drug affordability and accountability price review boards. And there are a variety of other things that states have done, uh, as well as things that the federal government is proposing. Uh, I think we need to look for these new directions, uh, regulatory and legal and litigation, all those. I close by a phrase that I've come to hold near and dear. A drug that one cannot afford is neither safe nor effective. I don't get better by staring at a drug on the shelf in the pharmacy or at the drug company. I have to be able to afford it and use it properly with the advice of my physician and pharmacist. And we all can do better if we can afford it. Right now we can't. Thank you very much, Dr. Schondelmeyer. I have just one question from Representative Neuer. Uh, Madam Chair, in the interest of time, I think uh, we'll defer that question to another time. Thanks. Okay. And uh, Representative Grunhagen? Yeah, in the interest of time, I will ask my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have one minute to yeah, okay. please. And the answer is one minute. So. Yeah. Okay. You know, like I said, I've been in the health insurance and the healthcare industry for a long time. <laughs> one of the things I noticed in healthcare, doctor and hospital, is the low reimbursement from government health government, uh, care plans like Medicaid and Medicare that hospitals and doctors try to cost shift to uh, auto insurance, workman's comp, or private insurance, which has aggravated their prices and they've gone up. Do Medicare and Medicaid pull, pay full retail price or do they take substantial discounts from the retail price and then drug companies are trying to cost shift that as part of the aggravation, I know there's other parts, uh, to the private market mm -hmm. and the private citizen. Dr. Schondelmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be expeditious in the answer. Uh, there is cost shifting in the pharmaceutical market. It's not quite like it is in hospitals and physicians. Uh, some of that cost shifting goes on, though, when uh, I would say Medicaid gets pretty good prices usually. Medicare, not so, because they can't negotiate. Uh, we've divided the market and said that each and every Part D plan, each and every two of the 2,000 Part D plans in the country is, can negotiate on their own. That's like Best Buy Corporation at the corporate office telling each store, you go negotiate with the company in Japan to buy your big screen TVs. We're not going to do it for you. That's not efficient. And then where else does cost shifting occur? Uh, when drug companies have copay coupons and patient assistance programs, some patients are helped, and I applaud that, but that costs comes from cash pay patients, the commercial market, and Medicare overpaying for their drugs. Okay. All Thank right. You. Well, Dr. Schondelmeyer, we really, really appreciate your coming here today. This has been really fascinating. And uh, members, tomorrow we're going to learn a little bit more about our nonprofit HMOs and what they're doing with their reserves. Thank you.